2 Corinthians today, we started uh, chapter 11 last week just briefly, and now Paul uh, continues to theme. He emphasizes he loved the love he has for the church there. If I commit an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me. The brethren, which came from Macedonia, supplied, and in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, <clears throat> no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. All right. As we start this week, uh, <coughs> Paul focuses again on the point of his love for the church, and he even uses, you know, sarcasm describing it. Says things like, I robbed other churches, because really, you know, Paul didn't go and steal stuff from other churches. Basically saying, probably money that needed to go somewhere else. I went to you to make sure uh, that you were taken care of. Um, explain any time he took up collections for them, sacrifices made, and to make sure they advance in the faith. And as we go back through 2 Corinthians, this whole book has been Paul uh, defending his apost apostolic authority, telling the church, you know, that he love and care for them. And there's apparently still some in the church at Corinth that were really, you know, going back against him. And we have these two long, long letters. You know, most of the letters of Paul, we have the, the long letter to Romans, which is more theological. We have these two long to Corinthians and all other Paul's letters are four or five chapters. So this really, he really must have had a burden and concern for this church at Corinth. And now he's going to warn about false teachers. Verses 12 to 15. But what I do that I will do that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion that wherein they glory they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. I say again, let me, let me stop right there. Verse 15, all right. Two points Paul emphasizes in this book, like I said, his apostolic authority and his desire for them to accept him as a legitimate apostle and a person who has the authority to teach them doctrine. Also here he demonstrates his current concern for them with warning about false teachers. All right, I'm sure since Jesus walked out of the grave and then today, 2,000 years later, there's always false teachers. You know, there's some things that are taught that aren't really, aren't like maybe, you know, of all the views of the end times, only one's going to be right. You know, someone who, say, teaches pre-trib and a pre-trib's not right, wouldn't really call them a false teacher. They're making, but the, he's talking about people who are teaching something, you know, false doctrine, contrary against the basics of the gospel. He gives him famous, the famous verse 14, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. All right, how many times have we heard this illustration? He doesn't appear in red suit, horns, and a tail. He's deceptive. Uh, you know, sometimes in these uh, near-death experiences, which some of I believe are genuine, but then people who are non-believers will just say stuff uh, like I saw a light and it was beautiful and they weren't really living for the Lord. They don't really talk about the Lord or anything. You kind of feel maybe that's Satan deceiving them, thinking what you're doing is all right. You're a good person. Just keep on what you're doing. And he's deceptive. He knows how to get people, and so we just have to be discerning with that. So how are we beware of this deception? We're tested by the Word. So if somebody says something contrary to the Bible, uh, you know, say, well, hey, hold a second. Well, this says this here, and you're saying this here. And the guidance of the Holy Spirit, something to test us, you know, whether or not something is genuine. And that doesn't mean it is, you know, even if we if we don't, our, our, our uh, introductory reaction is, I don't believe that's right. Wait it out, test it, pray about it, and see what the Lord says to you about it. Because the Lord has 
as we read in the Old Testament, has done strange things, <laughs> told his people to do strange, very strange things in the Bible. But he does, the Lord does all things in order and in, in purpose. And Paul sets a script to say he's an answer to describe his suffering. Paul suffered many things. We read about it when we studied Acts. And now he's getting to tell them in the specific. The first, he sets the stage for it here in verse 16 through the first verse part of the <coughs> I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise, yet as a fool, receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as that were foolishly in the confidence of boasting. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face, I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. All right. Uh, as I read there, you ever notice people um, who uh, um, the worse people treat them, the better they, they seem to, to like that person. It's always a great mystery here. And Paul is kind of saying that here. And he's, I'm, I'm going to tell you the things I went through for you and people who've done nothing for you, uh, you seem to be treating better. Throughout this letter, Paul makes his case. Now he tells them how they have accepted those who did less. Now he tells them that the things that he has gone through in his constant pursuit to spread the gospel. All right, so let's go back and remember our Acts uh, studying. Uh, uh, the, from about chapter 9 on, it's all about Paul. And we know it wasn't a bed, a bed of roses what Paul went through. He went through great costs. So now he's going to begin here in this uh, end of... Of, of chapter 11 to talk about some of the suffering that he went through. I'm going to get in the second part of, of verse 21 and read down to verse 29. How be it, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measures, in prisons more frequent, in deaths off. So that might have been in a better translation. Basically, Paul saying all the things that have done to him. Of the Jews, five times received I, I received 40 stripes, say one. So the Jewish law was you couldn't whip a man more than 40 times. So it says five different times he was whipped 39 times there. So what's that? or 295 stripes on his back at least Paul took for the spreading of the gospel. There was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Uh, we know there's a story in Acts where Paul is left for dead after he'd been stoned and they prayed for him. So that's probably the same that incident there. Thrice or three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeyings often, or as he says, thrice or three times I've suffered shipwreck. And he's writing this before the big shipwreck at the end of Acts that we talked about, where they're at sea for 14 days in a hurricane. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watching often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches, who is weak, and I am not weak, who is offended, and I burn not. And in summary, Paul has been through a lot <laughs> of stuff. Paul begins by reaffirming that he is a true Israelite, a Jew, just, like, just as much as anyone, any of the apostles, a descendant of Abraham. He says in a, a place in Acts, he comes from the tribe of Benjamin. Then he begins a list of the many things he has suffered. It says in prison, in danger, beaten three times. He was whipped 39 times, uh, five, like I said, five different cases. Beaten with rods, stoned. We read about all this in Acts, of course. Left was dead, left for dead. And some said when he was left for dead in Acts, when they stoned him, took him outside the city, could that have been when he had the revelation uh, that we're going to talk about in this next chapter? That's one of the theories. Once again, compare the life of Paul to today's top-known evangelists and pastors. We have quite a contrast. Uh, 
the, the, that was the, that's what was given to the man, the reward for him who spread the gospel more than any other person, of course, the Lord himself. Now, I think about this now. Of course, some of these teachers are in it for the fame and the money. They would never go anything like this. But that's also not saying even some of the more well-known uh, ministers in this country, they who are well-respected, are not going to have to go through this. For some reason, the Lord allowed this. And he allowed the apostles also to go through a lot of suffering. But I think the main reason was uh, when the message of Christianity was just starting, they, the, the people needed to see that the ones who actually knew Jesus uh, were willing to spread this message yes. and die for this yes. message to know that it's true. Right yes. now we have 2,000 years of church history, you know, and, and, and hundreds and, th and thousands of writings and confirmations of the word. But this was the early start. They demonstrated the power of the Spirit, and they seen the people willing to die for their faith. And as when Paul, when the Lord called Paul, he said, "I've shown you many things; you must suffer for my sake." And Paul will talk about other places in the Bible that he was glad to do this for the spread of the gospel. All right, this went on for 20, 30 years. He's been in heaven now two thousand years. You think he regrets any of this that he's done? And how many people are here uh, in heaven because of him? And how many? throughout the ages have took encouragement from the words that the Lord wrote through him. <clears throat> All right, well, here's what I was, I was trying to think of. Imagine the worst trip of your life, and this is Paul's daily experience. I was thinking of a, a couple of, back in the early days when we had bus trips in our church, there was family day to Kings of Manion, and I, the first time I went, I think it was about 12, and we, we had still had several buses here. That was the early 80s. And we let Parkway Church of God, for some reason, take one of our buses. I don't know why, but I thought they had plenty of buses there. So we go to Kings of Manion. We come back. We're eating at that Bay Bridge by the, uh, um, um, eating at the Bay Bridge, eating at the McDonald's by Bay Bridge, which everybody used to go when, when they used to go to Eastern Shore. It's late at night, and we somehow they got word to us that the, the other bus that Parkway's in had broken down. So... Um, the McDonald's people said, you all can stay in here. So, so whoever was driving the bus went back to the Parkway people, picked them up, took them home, and we had to wait for another bus from Crisfield to come get us. And I, I forgot which time eventually the McDonald's people got tired of They kicked us out. We, had, we were all waiting in the parking lot. And when we get home, 6 in the morning. And I said to myself, I'll never do that. I, I'm, I just remember me and my brother went to bed, and Mom and Dad waking us up said, Dinner's on our lunch, you know, lunch at, she'd fix lunch after church. And I knew it was like what, one o'clock I'd slept too, like, like that. That's the latest I ever slept in my life. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I said, oh, never again. So four years later, <laughs> you say you couldn't top that trip. I, four years later, I topped it. So we went again on the church bus. We go to Kings of Manions. Everything's <laughs> fine. I remember Jimmy Charnick was on, was on the bus and, and, uh, <laughs> I think it was that. He was on the first one. I don't know if he's on the second one. So we go past, uh, I don't know, I don't think I've shared this story before. We, we get a little bit past Easton, and this is like almost 30 years ago, so things are not built up. You know, that, nowadays it's kind of built up, but then, see, if you got past Easton, there's nothing until you get to the Bay Bridge. So we break down. Uh, and so we sent out Brent Tall and Clay Whitelock to to. Get somebody. No cell phones. This is 1986. So they go off into the dark. It's pitch black. They go to, finally someone lets them. One person said, so I'll be right there. They never came. One per, poor person let them in. They called up Brother DeFino. He was still here at the Parsonage, I think. And they said, our bus is broke down. Uh, can, what, what do we do? So they wake up Dave Adams. Uh, Dave drives all the way there. So we have to you know, wait for him. Wait. It's probably hour, hour and a half before we get that straight. He drives to Easton, picks us up. We get in his bus, go in there about 10 minutes, and all of a sudden she starts smoking and going crazy and all this. And he's a school bus, you know. So this you expect it out of a church. Church Most church buses are whenever they're not good enough for schools. And again, church is buying cheap. This is when he's running, taking kids to school. And I remember uh, one of them said, get out of the bus as quick as you can. So we all, some girls were screaming stuff, so they got out, broke down again, so we sent out Brent and Clay again, <laughs> off into the darkness, 
and they, the they finally somebody <laughs> lets them in. They call Brother Dafino. I imagine he's saying, "This is a joke, right? You're like in Marion, right? Almost here." And uh, so he calls Carl out, and Connie out was going through. Carl drove a bus. He comes and picks us up, and then we get home eight in the morning. And then I said, "I'll never go to King." I think the next year we went on a chartered bus after that. But I told there that was just like two unbelievable experiences. But Paul had these like everywhere he went it seemed like so just imagine that one thing about those things you know when the, when the next day was over with and you're you're laughing about it on, on a day later but at the time <laughs> you're not laughing at it and that's that's what i thought of when i think of all the examples that paul went through then we went on a bus once again and worked to king's dominion i won't tell that full story and our brakes went out coming down a mountain and oh, you know how johnny goldsburg is always joking he was going Pray, everybody in the bus pray thought he was joking. He was serious as a heart attack. So, moral of the story, don't go anywhere on a church bus. <laughs> if somebody talks about bringing the bus ministry up again, say, no, that was for the, that was for the 70s. <laughs> everybody drives now. Even the poorest people out there have a nice, <laughs> have a nice car. All right, so he closes the example by referencing back here, verses 30 to 33. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed for ever, evermore, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Aridus the king kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. We remember that story. That was right after Paul's conversion. So right away... He was a wanted man from at that point. Remember, they left him, let him down in the basket outside the city. And then that's the famous passage that many missionaries and money raisers have given over the years, hold the ropes. So in other words, you might not be able in your own self go to the mission field, but by financially supporting missionaries and stuff like that, you're like those who held the ropes and got Paul safely out of the city and allowed him to have a lifetime of ministry. Chapter 12, Paul reveals in this vision. I'm just Then I talked about when Paul was stoned to death, left for dead. Some might have thought this is when Paul had this revelation uh, that he talks about. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Basically saying here, don't know whether I was physically dead or not. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. In such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Paul, like John the Apostle, he's not specifically saying me. We know when John said in the book of John, the disciple Jesus loved, Paul is talking about himself in here. No one doubt, doubts that. That's not a mystery. When he says the third heaven, uh, first heaven is between the earth and the sky, the atmosphere. Second heaven is all of outer space, and the third heaven is actual heaven itself. So Paul saw vision into heaven. Uh, whether or not Paul left his body or was just receiving a vision, he doesn't know. But it was so amazing. He said, "I'm not allowed to write down what you write, what you know, like you know what Paul seen there." I believe John says that also in Revelation. In one place it says, "Don't don't write what was said." And Paul then wants to assure them he's not boasting. Uh, but what he's saying here, Apostle Paul has really risen up the ranks. Uh, now remember, um, let's go back to the Jesus' ministry. He chooses the 12. Paul's nowhere around to be seen. He's probably, you know, studying somewhere. Did he ever encounter Jesus on earth? We don't know. We know at the beginning of the church, he was trying to, you know, maybe even killed, was trying to uh, persecute Christians, arrest them. Uh, was that the you know, holding the, clo the clothes or coats when they were stoning Stephen to death? Now all of a sudden God chooses him and says, you're the vessel, you know, these apostles are reaching here, Judea, Samaria, I'm taking you to the whole uttermost parts of the earth. 
Paul even spends time alone with the Lord where God gives him revelations that he doesn't give anyone else. And as a result, you know, maybe some in the church, maybe even Peter, John saying, well, who is this Paul? I mean, he was like, and while we were walking with the Lord bodily, he's out somewhere studying and even comes against us. But they cannot deny how the Lord just blesses his ministry. And then when they see the sacrifice he's making, it's not like he's living in a mansion somewhere in Rome uh, saying, donate to my ministry. He's going out there into the field, giving his very life. So then he talks about the famous thorn in the flesh right after this revelation. So maybe as a result of all the things the Lord has called Paul to do, there is a tendency, you know, for him to say, you know, I must be really something for the Lord for to give me this great task. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice or three times that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in, infirm in infirmities and in reproaches in necessities, in persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. All right. All right, this class is what I call summary class. Uh, on Wednesday night, Ray is an in-depth class. You know, I, I go through a chapter or two a week. Ray goes through a verse or two a week, but he goes off and everything. This is something that you could, you know, go on for a couple weeks. Paul's thorn in the flesh. Uh but, you know, there's, like I said, if there's ever a verse you could look long into, what is it? I was looking at some of the suggestions. Some suggested it was frustration with the Jewish rejection of the gospel. And we do see that in Acts. I mean, he'll, he'll, he goes to the synagogue first, and his own people reject the message. The one who, you know, read the law, who came out, read about the prophecies of Christ. And many times, <coughs> one time in frustration, he said, that's it, I'm taking my message to the Gentiles. Uh, some say it's Paul's opponents. We listed all the things he'd been to. Everywhere he goes, not only did Jews, Gentiles stoned him, beat him, imprisoned him. And then some thought a physical infirmity. You know, I don't believe that. My view, I don't buy God wants any of us sick uh, for his glory. So my view, I believe it was a spiritual thing. One of the reasons I believe that it says, what does it say there again? Uh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. So some kind of uh, spiritual, I guess, tormentor. And when Paul said, I besought the Lord three times, I don't believe, you know, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I believe there was probably three times in his life that I'm, I'm going to get alone for a few weeks and pray about this. And finally the Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient. So one of the things we can learn from that, there is there is times when God says no. So when he does, even if it's something you want really bad, you, you in the end you have to say, all right, Lord, you know what's best here. If it's something you're struggling with more than anything, you know, what a powerful verse. My grace is sufficient for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I heard a minister, it was Lorraine one time said, he said, uh, the enemy might not attack you where you're weakness. He might attack you where you think you're the strongest because you might feel you're not vulnerable there and you're okay. Whatever the case, he knows where to get you. But whenever you fail, you're at a point where uh, I can't take this anymore. This is too much. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Quote this verse. Mm -hmm. Say, my say, Lord, I admit I can't do this. My, uh, my, I'm weak here. But he says that's where my grace is. All right, let's read it again. My grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So that's when you're saying. That's when you're demonstrating. It's not you. It's the Lord working in you. So he says, there, gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And then he take, uh, and I take pleasure in infirmities, which he's had, and reproaches, which he's had, and necessities, and persecutions, and discretions. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So, okay. <laughs> there we go. Someone said amen in the <laughs> congregation. So, when we're at our weakest, Christ is at his strongest. Remember that. Right now, continuing. And he's still making the case that he's not inferior to other apostles. 
I am become a foreign glory, and ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you for a nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is it wherein you were inferior to other churches, except to be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. Paul makes it known that he is no less an apostle than any other twelve. You know, say someone uh, said to you, um, who would you like to meet? Would you write to Lee? Uh, Simon a Zealot, James a Less, uh, maybe James or, or uh, Matthew, or would you rather meet Peter? They all said, well, we want to see Peter, Peter. Then they said, well, would you rather meet Peter or Paul? They said, well, we want, we want to see Paul. And that's what I would say because Paul seems to have all the theological answers. He said to them, I'm no less an apostle than them. I was called a special apostle, even though I didn't meet the requirements of being with Jesus during his ministry. The Lord called me out specifically to take this message to the Gentile world. All right. In closing out chapter two, a couple more, chapter 12, Paul's spiritual father. Behold, the third time I'm ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you for the children. Ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend to be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. But be it so, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Did I make a gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Walk we not in the same spirit? Walk we not in the same steps? As Paul comes to close to this book, he again refers to his upcoming third visit. So three different times he came to Corinth. So this really must have been an important place on his ministry. He gives the illustration that he is like a spiritual father to them. You know, a child is not responsible for a parent. This doesn't mean an adult uh, child. It means, you know, you know when, when you're 12, 13 years old, you're not the one supposed to be uh, supplying the needs for your parents. I've, we've seen examples of that sometimes, but... It's the reverse. The parent is supposed to take care of the child. Paul is like a parent. And this church of Corinthians is like his children. It's like I said, Paul is a spiritual father to the church there. And even these things was for their benefit. And he closes out chapter 12. Again, thank you that we excuse ourselves unto you. We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things dearly beloved for your edifying. For I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as you would not, lest there be debates, envyings, wrath, stripes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults. And lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many which have sinned already, and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness, lasciviousness which they have committed. So Paul shares a concern and fear he makes it known that he is concerned for the members of the church of Corinth and their behavior. We can go back to 1 Corinthians, so there was immorality in the church. And as his visit approaches, he wants to explain to them that the reason of his scolding was that his fear is going to find them falling into sin. So uh, it seems like several places in this letter it says Paul's difficult when he's writing to them, but when he gets there in person, he's more compassionate, loving, and forgiving. And then finally, his concluding remarks. I've broken them down into three sections here, but for time's sake, I'm just going to read the entire chapter because it's basically uh, just a farewell greeting there. This has been a long book, whereas, you know, maybe Galatians or Ephesians might have a couple paragraphs. This has a, time, a final uh, an entire uh, chapter to say goodbye. This is the third time I'm coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time. And being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again, I will not spare. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, and we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. <clears throat> Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that you do no evil, 
not that we should appear approved, but that you should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak, and you are strong, and this also we wish, even your perfection. Therefore I write these things, being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification, and not to destruction. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. I don't remember I mentioned Brother DePino. I don't know if you remember him. That's how we ended every service. Now by the grace of our Lord and Savior. We kind of made fun of him back then. We were, we were more Church of God. Eh? And we said, what are you, Catholic, Brother Finn? What, what kind of, eh? He's just quoting from the Bible. Just a couple final comments. Third visit means two previous visits. Remember, he said this was probably the fourth letter to the Corinthians. Two made the canon of Scripture. Uh, he again makes one final appeal of his authority by lifting up Jesus for whom all authority comes. He exhorts them to examine themselves whether being the faith that's something we can daily do each day see if there's anything in our lives that we need to, you know, get the Lord to help us with. He mentions he is writing, this is a harsh letter that what hopefully that when he gets there these needs can be taken of it can be more of a more pleasant visit by the way time he arrives there. And finally, like all of Paul's letters, he closes out with his usual salutations, what I just read there. So 2 Corinthians has been somewhat unique. This whole battle is Paul uh, you know, saying, I am a true apostle, and I have the authority to teach you these things. And as I've said throughout this book, when Paul's teaching, there is no Bible. So it's like a person coming in here saying, this is how you live, uh, you know, without any scripture to back it up. He's saying, the Spirit gave me this. And now, of course, now we accept the scripture. So... He had to defend this. All right, next week we'll go into Romans, and most people call that the center theological piece of the Bible. So I might take one chapter a week in Romans because there's so much stuff in there. All right, all right we'll close in prayer if anyone has any comments or questions. Lord, we thank you for the lesson this morning. I ask that you bless the remainder of the service and bless everyone here today uh, and as we go our separate ways. We pray this in Jesus' name. Check off another book. <laughs> Second print. Well, I'm going to get out.